I've done a lot of things. Some people know me as someone who tried to go to space. Some people know me as a tech person. Other people know me as a health person. So, I mean, which in the end is kind of the point that you, know, you bring skills, but then the, the goals you try and achieve with those skills will vary a lot. Yes, that's fine. And how did you get there? Now you're a tech investor and especially a tech um, entrepreneur. Or do you define yourself as a tech entrepreneur? No. no. Um, so my parents were both scientists. My mother was a mathematician and my father was a physicist. So I, I felt completely comfortable with science, but I also did not think I was going to be the best because they were, they were really good. So in the end, I became a reporter and a fact checker for Forbes magazine, right, writing about business. And I got what I think is the very best training of all, which is to ask questions and then to listen to the answer skeptically and figure out what's true. And ironically, if you want me to go ahead in these days with chat GPT and generative AI, it turns out, oh, my God, we, we don't know how to teach these kids to write because they'll cheat. But the reality is you don't need to cheat them. You don't need to teach them to write. You need to teach them how to ask good questions. And then is this answer true? Or so in the end, that skill is probably the best skill of being a human being. And first I applied it on Wall Street for five years. I was a securities analyst. Then I applied it for pretty much 25 years with my conference and my newsletter about the computer business, which was also in 1989, I started visiting Russia which was a very interesting place to ask questions and get answers because it was completely different from the rest of the world. And I learned a lot more about the United States than I learned about Russia from being in Russia because I looked at it from outside. Then I stopped and became sort of, so in some way I had retired in 1982 because I had, bought my own business from the owner and I had no boss. I was basically doing what I loved, which was asking people questions about the computer industry and getting answers. And then I sort of formally retired in 2007 and became a tech investor, ended up spending six months training as a cosmonaut in Star City outside Moscow. I've read about it. Can you talk about it a little bit? What does this uh, education look like and how how did you get there? Well, I was I was also an investor in a couple of space companies. One was Space Adventures, which was sort of a basically a travel agent for the for Roscosmos. If you went to NASA or the European Space Agency and you said I'd like to go into space, they would say, "Yeah, you can join the military, train for 12 years, and then if you're lucky, maybe And the Russians would say, this is impossible. Well, how much money you think? And so for, at that time, 20 million, now it's more like 60 million. You could go into space with, through Russia as a civilian, through this company, Space Adventures. Of course, I didn't have the 20 million, but they said, why don't you train as a backup? And after about two years of You know, just investing, but with no no central purpose. I thought, yeah, I should do that. So I took six months off, spent them in Star City in Moscow. And as I mentioned, I knew Russia already quite well, and I can speak Russian. But what I had never really explored was Soviet Union, because when I went there in 89, 90, it was just ending. But... Star City was still a government installation. This was 2008, 2009. And it was really interesting. The food was terrible. The, uh, the people from NASA were very nice. I was a Roscosmos client, but the actual NASA working people, yeah, come, come have dinner with us. You're another American. would love to meet you. And I uh, learned about space plumbing and space medicine went in a centrifuge, uh, 
it, it was just, and at the same time, we had no maps because the Russians said this was a security risk. So I couldn't find my classrooms. And it was, it was very interesting. I, and aren't you afraid of going to the space? Oh, no, no, I'd love to. You're I mean, curious. Yeah, quite a few people do it. And and my father was in in that world, which is how I got interested in Russia in the first place. My my long-term goal is to retire on Mars, but not not very soon. Okay. You know, 40, 50 years when it's when it's ready. Okay. So you you learned about STEM? Um, asking questions, being a journalist, writing about it, talking to others in conferences, and that's the way how you learn. Always going to the, to the next to the next area, technological area. I have this piece of advice, which is never take a job for which you are qualified, because that's good. Yeah, the the way to learn is just go out and do it, and usually people around you. You can learn from them. They want to help you. They want you to do better. Uh, and like, if you want to learn French, go to Paris. Don't don't sit in a room. And so I've yeah, I started when I was thirteen. I persuaded my parents to let me live in London for a year with friends of my father's. And then when I was seventeen, I dropped out of college and went to Morocco for two months. Mm -hmm. With my boyfriend, who was in the the Peace Corps, uh, and you know, so whether it's a country or or an industry, just to get back to the sequence after after the space training, I was starting to invest in health and healthcare because the internet was becoming, you know, more interested in things that were frivolous, like shampoos for dogs, and I don't know what. Yeah. And if you if you start looking at healthcare, the obvious question you have to ask is why are we spending so much money fixing people, especially in the US, instead of keeping them healthy in the first place? So that that became for me the central question. And it turns out it it's not a problem with the healthcare system, it's a problem with the education system, with the way we raise children with how we treat mothers through pregnancy with especially in the United States, the economy, poor, poor people don't get enough help to raise children effectively. So I started a 10 year project called Wellville, which will now end at the end of 2024, working in five small U.S. communities to figure out how to help them build these institutions for themselves. And the, we, we learned a lot, but the ultimate answer is the government needs to create more of a level playing field in the United States, under, you know, create this social fabric that is what really people need more than you know, big companies and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've seen you have uh, done a LinkedIn uh, online course as well to about this topic, and so we um, we will link to this. So you have done your your career. I couldn't formulate the next question very well in the live session. So here it is in a nutshell. When you look back on your journey, is there anything you wish you had done differently? Um, not really. I mean, I'm very comfortable with randomness. And moving forward, but not, you know, move forward, don't move towards a point. Because as long as you're moving forward, you, you, you pick something up along the way. Uh, my original job, you know, when I was probably 19 or 20, if you had asked me, what job do you want? It was to be the Moscow bureau chief for the New York Times. Ah, oh, cool. But I don't regret not doing that. It, it mm -hmm. was... It was more sort of an example than a, oh, I got to do this. And in the same way, I, I would like to die on Mars. But, you know, it's it's not, it won't be a failure if I die on Earth. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's some kind of interesting point that's far enough away that you can move towards it, not in one path. 
Okay. So I did end up in Moscow. I did not end up as near Times Purity. But there are a lot of opportunities at the moment and uh, the future is open. What do you think? Um, what will you learn at the next level or for the next level? Yeah. So when when we when the Wellville project is finished, yes, we help the communities to build their own institutions. We didn't build them for them. So when we leave, you know, they're fine. They they have what they built and they're their friends. What Most of us, so Wellville is six, seven people. Probably half of us will go on and become you know, public advocates, writing books, giving speeches. Our CEO will talk more to the healthcare establishment. I'll probably talk more to the, the politicians and the, mm -hmm. the, the news shows. Try, trying to explain that spending, investing in people is indeed investing. It's not spending. You create value. You don't simply. So it's one of our mottos is don't rent your health, invest in it. Yes. Cool. And so becoming a public advocate, I've written one book. So you know, now I'll write a couple more. Okay. And uh, this, is the, this is your next career path being an author again. Yeah, more like author, spokesperson. I mean, the presenter. Yeah, the point of it is, not, mm -hmm. is not to write the book. The point of it is to yes. change public thinking. And the way to do that, I hope, is to write books and articles and do interviews on uh, on Zoom and Google Meet. And uh, being a journalist again. Huh? Yeah, in some sense. Mm -hmm. More of a, you know, less of a report. I mean, in a sense, yeah, a reporter on 10 years working in five communities around the U.S. and what we learned and the questions we asked. Yes. Cool. I'm uh, really curious to, to read about it because I uh, like the idea of uh, doing some best practices in small communities and looking how you can help them. I don't have to ask you what do you still want to learn to get involved into the future. I, you are always um, creating the future. Is this your your life motto? Creating future by yourself? Well, no. The I mean the the actual motto is always make new mistakes. Okay. Yeah. Keep experimenting. Learn. Don't do the same thing again. So I would I would not do the space training again, but I would absolutely do it once. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, let's come to the point um, who, who we want to address. Yeah. But, um, there are a lot of career potentials at the moment. There are a lot. There's a lot of stuff to be done at the moment. Except when we look at the climate crisis and all the other crises, um, there's really a lot to do. And people. Uh, ChatGPT, you have uh, named it. What do you advise to to women working not in the STEM sector at the moment, but uh, who maybe want to be part of the future as well? So how did the, they get there? Uh, the first thing is to again to ask questions. You know, because you are an outsider, you see things more broadly. You see them from the point of view of someone who's not in STEM. So the first thing you can do is help these STEM people understand how to explain better to people like you what's going on. You know, make it more intelligible. What are what are the things that are meaningful to a broader population than the people who are in STEM? And understanding that you bring a new perspective. You've been around, you know, you're you're old enough not to be scared. Mm -hmm. The first time you're fired, it's really scary. And then after that, it's, well, okay, I got fired. I survived. I don't need to. So in some sense, the older you are, the more you have survived, the more you've done for yourself, the, the more right you have to ask questions because you've seen a lot. Okay, I'm not stupid. Explain this to me. I need to explain it to my friends. And then you, know, you also have a sense of perspective that amazing things happen in the world, horrible things, good things. And yet, one way or another, 
life goes on. And the question is how to make that better, not how to fix everything, but how to fix. There's some piece of it you can fix better than anybody else. There are other things. To be honest, I have nothing to do with the environment. I try to throw away my trash and so forth, but I'm more focused on you know, human human health, human intellectual development. Okay. And um, so it's not because I don't care. It's because everybody is best suited to one or two things or five things, that, but nobody needs to do it all. Everyone should do some part and then find partners. Sorry. No. Um. As you mentioned, the, the artificial intelligence, and uh, do you see there a new revolution? Is it uh, comparable to the smartphone area uh, in in terms of um, disruption, or how do you how do you look at this? So it, yeah, I mean, it's not as smart as people think, but it is extremely a large scale. So it can write very boring marketing messages at massive scale, and it can write them to individuals, not just to to groups or to kinds of people. So it's extremely powerful, and that's what makes it both very useful and also very dangerous because you're giving this kind of power to not just to good people doing business, but to bad people trying to disrupt politics, trying to persuade people to get mistaken and send money to the wrong people. Uh, and to some extent, one of the first things we need to do, and this is something where, how shall we say, women of a certain age could be very helpful, figure out how do we want to regulate this? And to be honest, I think it's too fast moving For the government to regulate it. I think what we need to do is establish liability for the use of it. And especially for the large companies that are are the foundation of all this, that there are going to be these large companies with huge data training farms, and then there are going to be companies doing sales promotion letters, there are going to be companies doing training materials, there are going to be all kinds of things. And people who cause harm need to be liable for that harm, unlike what Facebook and TikTok and the others are now doing to especially teenagers. Mm -hmm. uh, in Europe, the, the, the discussion about uh, artificial intelligence is very much about... Uh, Uh, that they are afraid of losing their jobs, that the machines are better than the the humans in some job, uh, in maybe in most, um, no, at least uh, knowledge jobs. And um, how do you see this uh, this co working with uh, machines and humans? Um, how what would you suggest to um, to women? like me or others, how can they handle this? Again, the machines are good at answering questions with known knowledge. They are not good at coming up with new questions. They don't understand how these things work. They can simply repeat what people have said because that's where they learn from stuff that's already being written down. And I mean, in my own experience, when I was in high school and in college, The education I was getting, I found very boring and I wasn't a very good student because it was simply repeating stuff people had already said, you know, read the book and write an essay. Once I became a reporter and I was asking questions and finding out new things, it got very interesting. Um, it would be great if people could work four days a week assisted by very powerful machines. But what the machines do is commodity. It's not art and it's not creative. It's mm -hmm. they construct things. Yes, they put things together that already exist, but they don't really put them together in new ways. So, you know, I think 
there will be huge changes, just as there are huge changes in farming or construction with the arrival of machines. There will be changes in knowledge work. But I, I think the, yeah, the boring work will be taken over by machines. The creative work will not. And for what it's worth, I think we have a huge need for more actual teachers not to read history books to children, but to help children to think and child care workers and just people being paid to be human to other people. Now you could argue they should just do that in their village, but given, given the reality of life now, uh, they need to be paid to do it in a, in a much more, if you like transactional society. But I do not want computers raising my kid. I want human beings doing that. And I want my kid to be a human being. So this would be also a good way for adult people to learn about tech is by teaching it, um, learning to teach it. Yeah. I mean, that's the best way to learn about it. Right now, I wanted to learn more about exactly what's going on with chat GPT. So I signed up to do a TED Talk. Mm -hmm. doing on Monday because ah. that forced me to again to figure out what it is I should know and so my talk is actually ironically in the form of six questions to myself okay so we can link it to this course as well because yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's will be six or eight minutes but yeah it, it should be ready in three days yes Perfect. So uh, last question, what do you recommend that I, we have talked about this now a lot, uh, what do you rec recommend women 45 plus to be part of the future is I would just uh, suppose you say, um, ask questions. Yeah. Ask questions and then, you know, find the ones that interest you most and just keep going. I mean, again, head, head forward. Don't head to, This is the final point. But there's a lot of change in the world going on. You, as a woman 50 or more, you, you have a lot of perspective and wisdom. And honestly, that's what the world needs right now, more than you know, a bunch of algorithms. These are perfect, famous last words, I would say. <laughs> Thank you very much, Esther, for this interview. It was uh, really an honor for me. And I will stop the recording now. Thank you and have a nice day. Well, thank you. And uh, yeah, it was good because I learned a lot too. So thank you for the questions. Thank you. <laughs>